Um, so uh, thank you um, for all, all of you for coming. I'm sorry I'm not Christopher Parker, who was supposed to be speaking today but had an emergency and wasn't able to make it. And he was going to talk about, um, I think, Tea Party politics and healthcare. And I'm going to talk about politics too, a different kind of politics. And I think all of the discussions on this panel today are talking about different ways of thinking about freedom and ways that we're, we're not free and how that might be impacting our health. Um, and so I want to mention really quickly that this is work um, that I've done with, uh, with a researcher named Ma Maggie Hicken at the University of Michigan. We've worked on a series of papers where we're really interested in understanding the role of chronic stressors and how that impacts health and health disparities. Um, so hopefully I'll get through most of this, but if not, we'll have Q&A. Um, I want to introduce this concept of black respectability politics for those of you who might not know about this concept. Um, and then I want to link this concept to another concept um, called vigilance um, and, and talk about the ways in which po the potentially engaging in black respectability politics can have health Im implications. Um, and then hopefully I can briefly discuss research that has been that I've done that links these things to health, but I can, or at least talk about it in broad strokes and potential implications for, um, for population health uh, disparities. Um, so the ideals of respectability and regulation of so-called appropriate behavior and presentation of self have loomed large in the lives of African Americans for generations. Um, respectability politics was coined by Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham in her influential book, Righteous Discontent. She addresses the role of the black Baptist woman um, movement between uh, 1880 and 1920 in contesting racism and sexism through a politics of respectability demanding civil rights, uh, equal employment, voting rights, and educational opportunities. Um, since then, many have distilled this term to mean adopting manners and morality of the dominant white culture as a way to counter um, negative views of, of black people and blackness. Um, I think one thing to mention, and I think Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham really gets upset about this, is that um, we sometimes forget that respectability was an especially radical notion um, back then, the notion that a black person would have enough respect for themselves to engage in great, uh, greater society on its own terms, taking full advantage of their First Amendment rights in the service of demanding the rest of their rights, was sufficiently radical to warrant the most extreme resistance from all levels and facets of the state. <clears throat> so um, in a highly politicized and fraught cultural moment, there are ranging interpretations of respectability politics and ongoing debates about the usefulness of respectability politics to protect and advance the African American population. And I think this is really clear um, in sort of debates around what people should or should not be doing in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so while interpretations of respectability politics are wide ranging, a recurrent theme involves impression management behaviors. Discussions on respectability politics either encourage or oppose the use of actions that focus on presentation of self for African Americans as a necessary or useful strategy to be safe and successful in a racist society. So I don't know if you read this article, it's really interesting. In October 2015, Randall Kennedy, a Harvard Law School professor, argued in a sprawling Harper's Magazine essay that it was in, def uh, that was in defense of respectability politics. And this was sort of kind of speaking to Black Lives Matter people who were, who, were, who were saying that this was not a useful strategy. And so he argues prudent conduct and sensitivity to how we appear to others improves our chances for success in environments peppered with dangerous prejudices. It is unfortunate that safety might require such self-consciousness, and it is imperative to reform society such that self-defense of this sort is no longer needed. In the interim, however, blacks should do what they can do to protect themselves against the burdens of a derogatory racial reputation and that has been in centuries in the making. Okay, so, um, so this is sort of one side of the black respectability politics argument. On the other side, um, sorry, oh yeah. Um, is uh, is um, is sort of different. So, however, many argue that these behaviors are indeed not protective and potentially harmful. Um, and this is uh, really well exemplified by Brittany Cooper, who's a professor of women uh, women and gender studies and Africana studies at, at Rutgers University, where she directly criticizes respectability politics behaviors as being ineffective in serving to improve the well-being of African Americans and protect them. And I'm gonna read you a quote from some of her work where she was responding to somebody who was critiquing the lack of respectability politics um, being used in the Black Lives Matter movement. So she argues, surely you, you know a suit and a tie won't protect you, so we're gonna keep on marching as you said. We will do so because black folks have already tested out your 
theory of respectability, we've been trying to save our lives by dressing right, talking right, and never, never fucking up since about 1877, and that shit has not worked. <laughs> I'm quoting her. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm not taking a sign. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay, sorry. I'm, uh, okay. um, interestingly, it has been argued that, it, that it's this dimension of black respectability politics, impression management, where proponents and opponents, oops, sorry, my bad. My, proponents and opponents um, often talk past each other. So um, I think this speaks to the universality of um, these burdensome behaviors. So even if you don't agree with respectability politics, you might still be engaging in them to sort of survive everyday life and navigate social spaces. Um, and while there remains um, little agreement on the usefulness of these strategies, it is clear both camps see these as impressive management tools, or see these tools as burdensome and, and have potential health implications for them. And I'm gonna return to that point later. I feel like I have to address the image I'm gonna show here. Um, and so this is just, um, I thought it was a really good image that uh, that speaks to kind of the Cooper's arguments, but this is by an artist named Mosey Moransi where he's trying to, sh he's also sort of criticizing the effectiveness of black respectability politics. So he's using sort of these common tropes of respect um, with symbols of hate and power, right? So basically it doesn't matter how you dress, who you are, you know, um, you're still gonna be dealing with, uh, you know, you're still gonna be the victim of Potentially, potentially living in a sort of racist society. Okay, sorry guys, I just prepared this yesterday. Um, so um, the social science literature has systematically documented the behaviors often discussed within the context of respectability politics. So before I was, I was drawing from, um, from sort of discussions that are happening sort of in, in media, social media, other sort of outlets like The Atlantic. But this is, uh, this is also something social scientists think about and talk about a lot. And a number of themes have emerged from the social science literature um, regarding the nature and, dim and dimensions of these behaviors. So I'm gonna highlight and discuss behaviors associated with three prominent themes that we've seen in the social science literature that sort of map onto these discussions. One is adapting presentation of self, including style of dress and ways of speaking, to reduce the likelihood of experiencing discrimination in social settings. The second is avoiding social situations where the likelihood of dis discrimination might be higher, and the third is sort of daily pre preparation for possible experiences with prejudice and discrimination. So um, black Americans frequently report the need to engage in impression management and uh, in, in impression management behaviors and the feeling that they have to be, that they have to be um, very careful about their appearances to get good service and to avoid being harassed or treated with the same level of respect as white people. And so, there, for example, in-depth interviews with professors at a Midwestern State University in 1999 found that black professors were more likely to report over preparing for class lectures, citing credentials, and dressing up compared to white professors to avoid stereotyping and questioning of competency and credentials from their students. And so one professor said, I'm always conscious of how I dress on teaching days. If I'm dressed casually on a non-teaching day and I go into some place like the library, I frequently get the feeling that people don't, people have absolutely no expectation that I could be I can be a faculty member. Um, um, impression management, another form of strategic uh, social negotiation for many African Americans may also include feeling the need to carefully monitor what they say and how they say it in an attempt to reduce the likelihood of experiencing discrimination. So in a personal narrative written by a black researcher about his experiences in high school, I think it reflects these actions. He said, because I felt that whites were constantly assessing the level of my intelligence and overall humanity, I was careful to speak with the greatest form of articulation. I made sure my statements were valid, factual, and creative. It became such an automatic response to my environment. Um, <clears throat> so black Americans also frequently report trying to avoid certain social situations and places where they may likely experience discrimination. So in a qualitative study of black customers in New York City and Philadelphia, a black woman described her avoidance of uh, stores as a way to ensure her respect was maintained. So that sounds a little counterintuitive, but I'll, I'll read it. So I used to work on the Upper East Side and I didn't really shop at any of those stores because I didn't want to be followed and that's a problem. That's definitely a problem. I have the money and I demand respect, but my way of demanding respect is just to avoid going to those stores. Um, and finally, uh, black Americans also anticipate discrimination. Um, while respect behaviors don't explicitly involve anticipatory thoughts and, uh, around potential discrimination, we offer that, the invisible, that these invisible thoughts might underlie and coincide with visible behaviors. So basically people, so our, we have these behaviors, but we're also doing these things in anticipation of discrimination. And black Americans frequently report having to prepare for the possibility of being insulted 
overtly and covertly on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so in a really uh, interesting study by Joe Fagan, who's really well known for kind of documenting uh, discrimination, discrimination among African American population, he, de um, he, he describes this um, in a really great, uh, what I think really sums up sort of his research. Uh, blacks must be constantly aware of the repertoire of possible responses to chronic burdensome discrimination. <coughs> One older respondent spoke of having to put on her shield just before she leaves the house each morning. As she leaves her home, she has tried to be prepared for insults and discrimination in public spaces, even if, um, if nothing happens that day. And it aligns really well with, um, I don't know if you read Mashable, but there was a really great article called Black Armor, and it talked about millennial black men who discussed sort of suppressing their sense of style to combat racial stereotypes, and part of getting dressed up was putting on their armor. So this idea of armor is sort of recurrent in different sorts of discussions around these issues. So um, research indicates uh, that this attention to presentation of self in preparation um, and in thoughts and behaviors for, the, for protection um, against prejudice and discrimination is a significant psychological burden with health consequences. Um, we introduce, okay great, we introduce a concept called vigilance defined as anticipatory and ruminative uh, thoughts and behaviors um, involved in the preparation for discrimination, uh, discriminatory treatment and mirror behaviors that align with the present of uh, self strategies encouraged by proponents of black, black respectability politics, but likely utilized by many um, African Americans. And I'm sorry, I'm not exactly reading what's on there. I hate when people do that, and I just did it, so I'm really sorry. Um, so uh, we use vigilant, the term vigilance to characterize a psychological state that is not necessarily contingent on prior interpersonal experience with discrimination, right? It's likely a byproduct of attempting to function in a racialized and racially hierarchical society and may arise through other representations of de devaluation associated with membership in a stigmatized group. So people aren't vigilant just because they've experienced discrimination before. They're vigilant because they constantly see, uh, you know, of black bodies being assaulted on the news or because of sort of racially quoted speech that's happening among politicians, right? There are different ways in which the messages of racial deval devaluation play out and it doesn't necessarily have to happen through an exact experience. And my work actually shows that. Um, so engaging in these behaviors is not without health uh, consequences. Um, and indeed, many opponents of respectability politics allude to the possible mental and physical health burdens of engaging in these behaviors. So in referring to Jackie Robinson, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, he did this in an article in the Atlantic Monthly, um, where he was sort of really upset with the twice as good arguments that are often embedded in black respectability politics discussions, like you have to be twice as good to, to make it. Um, and so when he's talking about Jackie Robinson, he's talking about being on the radio, and he says, I was on the radio, somebody was saying yesterday on the radio, well, you know, Jackie Robinson did this. And I told him, you got to remember, Jackie Robinson died young. Don't ever forget that. Every time you say that, remember that. You know, it wasn't just a matter of being better. This actually cost. It cost. We should probably stop bragging about Jackie Robinson and remember that he died young. He did. He did die very young. Um, chronic health complications. Um, so here's where I'm going to get a little techy, and I promise it'll be the only uh, slide like this. But science supports the notion that these chronic self-regulatory behaviors come with a health cost. So okay, that's fine. Um, I'm going to dis discuss this briefly because Anjum's going to kick me off the stage, but we can talk more about it in Q&A. Um, but evidence across different areas of the social, psychological, and biological science link these behaviors to health. So anticipation of potential stressful situa situations activates the body's primary stress response system. Um, and you, activation of the stress response system can occur even in the absence of the actual occurrence of a stressful situation. So you are, your body is constantly waiting and prepared for this to happen. Um, and although um, anticipation is critical and healthy component of stress biology, so we can talk more about, you know, it's good, you want to have a good stress response, chronically stressing out about something um, results in sort of dis dis uh, dysfunction of the stress response system, it leads to poor mental and physical health. In addition, this chronic anticipation of discrimination in conjunction with um, chronic uh, cognitive rumination about particular stressors is particularly harmful, right? So rumination is just constantly thinking about this issue over and over again. And this sort of drawn out pro process of c ruminating about past discriminatory events and ones that might come at, might come in the future leads to sort of chronic stress that has sort of negative uh, health outcomes. And I don't have, I wish I could explain this in more detail, but I'll, I'll talk about it more in Q&A if you're interested. Okay, and so just really briefly, um, so, I, so I've done, done some, using a survey data from, from population-based study in Chicago, 
there are questions that actually ask about vigilance. Um, and so there are these sort of four questions they ask in your day-to-day -day life. How often do you do the following things? Try to prepare for possible insults um, uh, from people before leaving. Feeling you have to always be careful about your appearance to get good service. Try to avoid certain social situations and then carefully watch what you say and how you say it. And we've created a scale um, using these. They're in a Likert scale. We've created a scale to sort of use these. Um, and in work that I'm happy to share later with you or if you email me, we've been able to link these experiences with, with vigilance to depressive symptoms, self-rated health, and chronic conditions. Um, we've also been able to show that vigilance uh, explains health inequalities in, in, in measured hypertension, so blood pressure cuff hypertension, self-reported um, sleep difficulty, and measured uh, weight, me weight measure, so BMI and uh, weight circumference. Um, also, I should have mentioned this before, I, I didn't go through all the empirical work, but vigilance is, uh, is reported at much higher rates among African Americans compared to whites. In fact, it's very different than discrimination measures where you actually don't see as much variation. Here, you know, there's clear racial differences, and also racial differences in, in how it impacts outcomes. So, in summary, it's not awesome. Engaging in vigilant behaviors is a c common for a majority of African Americans, and this is across genders, so even between white and, white and black women, we see these differences. Um, engaging in these behaviors frequently can lead to poor physical health outcomes and can help us to understand disparities. And if we believe that these things are happening at a population level, then these might also help us help be one particular stressor that might be driving some of the population health differences and outcomes that were discussed earlier today. Okay, sorry I talked fast, but I had to get there. <laughs>